Hello. Hello. Welcome back to Wandering Into Wellness. It's just the two of us. It is just the two of us and a big empty room. No, <gasps> hang on. What's that hum? Mm. <laughs> in the background, it is the bees. My bees. Finn's bees down in the back garden in Drimna, just below us here, humming away. And we wanted to talk to you guys because we really have been intending to do this for, I mean, three or four years. It's one of the first things we set out to do with Sue. And we'll do one on honey and bees because you keep bees and we like honey. Yeah, it's so weird, isn't it? I mean, I think mm. one of the things that I can't live without is honey. It's always in my house. I mm. use it for everything. And when I met you and you kept bees, it was like, oh, this is obvious. Like, <laughs> it makes what, sense of our friendship. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. And I meant, made acres and reams of notes on mm. honey. And we kept trying to, I don't know, we've tried to shoot it a bunch of times. I don't know, I don't know what's why happened. it hasn't happened. Anyway, here we are. So, yeah, it's very exciting. It's a perfect time. The bees are just, oh my God, so many of them out mm -hmm. by your hives at the bottom where we can see them. Yeah. And... Yeah, I mean, why did we want to talk about honey? I guess beekeeping goes way, way back to like ancient Egyptian times, right? It does go way, way back. It's as much part of our culture as we are part of its culture. I think that's what the, mm. it's one of those beautiful reflections of symbiosis. Like when you read in amazing books like Braising Sweet, Braising Sweetgrass about how certain elements of nature, in fact, most elements of nature, once they're well looked after and well tended and well fostered, they thrive as a result of human interaction. And bees are definitely one of those things. Our pollinators have been uh, destroyed, essentially our pollinator communities have been destroyed across the world as a result of, you know, monocropping agriculture, lots of awful pesticide use, neonicotinoid pestinoids, 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 particularly, but um, those are, uh, th those. We're, we're trying to kind of recover that now, we're trying to like, uh, essentially retrieve our, I suppose it's our dignity as humanity, isn't it? Because it's one of our great roles uh, to be foster parent to nature that's around us, and we have this amazing ability to foster bees as I've discovered in, in my most I mean rudimentary way but but yeah like uh, honey is is a is a, a theme that goes back the ages like you say yeah and bee, bees are kind of seen as a sacred animal in so many texts mm, they come yeah. up again and again and again there's a kind of a spiritual connection to the bee and to that kind of hive structure as well you see that again often in art and it's kind of like they're interwoven into our psyche into our creativity into our art, into our healing, into mm. our nutrition. Yeah. Like we're completely interwoven with yeah. them and we're completely reliant on them. Like you said, yeah. as the species have been declining, I mean, our species will decline in, in, in tandem with them. Very quickly, absolutely. They're worth something like $15 billion or more to the US economy alone. And that's just, you know, the economy. For That's how we always try to target. We're like, oh, what's it worth in money terms? Like, no, it's all our food. Something like 70% of the crops, like agricultural crops rely on you know, pollination from, from pollinators like bees. So it's a big thing. But yet, like you say, uh, from a spiritual point of view, there's like a, a really foundational component to bees in human uh, human history. Like they were, it was known as food of the gods and you see it referred to on the, the walls of the tombs. Uh, all the, the, the biggest, fam most famous pharaohs, <laughs> our favorite household names like Tutankhamun, they were buried with honey. And that gives you a sense because these guys, I mean, they whether they built the guy, built the friggin' things at Giza or not, we don't really know it's true. But they absolutely had a very like high art level of burial. Like it wasn't like, ah, chuck them in a coffin, burn them, chuck them in the ground, whatever it is. They were like, okay, there was like huge funeral processions. There was people who were buried alive with their, you know, with their, with their, their masters. And, and one of the very few things, very meaningful things that they were buried with was honey. And that gives you like, just pause for thought in a culture that says, agrarian as the Egyptians was. I mean, they invented like um, all of, a lot of the systems around, um, what was it, like improving like water source, like transition to, to their crops and all these sorts of things. They managed to make a very arid country into a really like thriving economy as a result of their ability to understand the natural world, how to harness its, you know, um, all of the resources there to treat them as resources maybe a bit, but also to, to make sure that they uh, they looked after them and then treasure them, treasure them through death, like into the afterlife. That was what he was taking honey to the afterlife. That, that's got to mean something. Yeah, and I remember when I was pregnant, my midwife saying to me, and it was maybe controversially because people then now are kind of funny about honey. Um, she said, yeah, just got have for honey. This podcast. <laughs> she said, uh, have honey every day during your pregnancy what? because it is nectar of the gods mm. and she was like you're going to get so many things from honey and when I was being told all these different conflicting don't eat cheese and don't eat sushi and don't blah, blah, blah. no peanuts and don't eat honey I was mm. like no no <laughs> I'm eating the honey okay. every day food of the gods and yeah like you said it's woven into so many things mm. what do you think makes beekeeping such an attractive thing 
to people? I mean, you are a beekeeper, so what drew you to it? it it's, it's weird, because I thought about this a lot. When I did my first beekeeping course, my mum gave me the present of a beekeeping suit and the course in whatever it was, down in Leeson Park or whatever it is in, in Dublin 6. And when I went into the room with all these beekeeping potential people and the beekeeping teachers, I was of the right sex. They're all men, like there's very few women. And I was about the youngest person there. So it was people in their 50s and 60s and beyond, the ones who weren't going off doing golf. There was some connection between men and ageing men and wanting to keep bees. There's something in the fussiness of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. There's something in the DIY component. Mm -hmm. But there's also something where you get, I mean, you get locked into the bees. I mean, because they're, they're relying on you and you're relying on them as well. Because I think a lot of people, it becomes a, a sort of a sideline, it starts as a sideline hobby, it becomes like a sideline income stream. It's like you're what you call it, you're on the side, whatever thing. Um, but I, I think that, yeah, the, the, the attraction for, for me certainly was just because this this fascinating like societal stuff that goes on where, you know, there's the communication between different elements of the, the bee, you know, bee colony and, and there's like specific roles they play for specific parts of their life. And when they finish that bit of the nurse, they go move on to being a forager. And when they finish, with, you know, there's all these sorts of like stages of maturation within the, the bee's life, which I think are just fascinating. And then there's a the communication stuff, which I mean, it's just bonkers, like just one of them. I'm just going to do one because I know we, we, <laughs> we, we'll, we can we'll be... circle back to them, I think. Will we? No, we'll tell that one. Now, okay, but okay. We will also circle back to. Okay, well, the, the, I think the most exciting thing is so when uh, a colony sets up for the first time in a new place, so the queen and her most experienced foragers are there in a big clump hanging on the side of a tree, perhaps. You might see them like just as they've swarmed. The, what happens is they send out the most experienced of those foragers to different direct, in different directions to try and find uh, where's a good place for a permanent hive. And they're like, okay, so they look at, and, and this is known, they look at the angle of the sun, they look at um, wind exposure, they look at moisture and temperature, they like look at the stroke, they, they actually assess the distance from, like the width distance for building comb inside this, the, the place they're gonna be, if it's a nook inside of a tree or like corner of a wall or under my neighbor's little, a little well thing that he has, like a little wishing well, those sorts of places they love. And so the bees come back from their little tours and what they do is then they have this like council where the, the foragers that come back, they tell the story of how close the like the, the place is and da da da. And then the they do it by like essentially dancing and the, the communication as they dance, they touch each other, we think, or there's some sort of vibration element. And within, you know, they essentially the bees then vote on who's the best idea. And then they go to whatever that place is. They go, okay, cool, we've chosen that. You know, Dave, your idea was trash, but Pete, we really like what you think about that corner bit under that apple tree, so we're going to head there. And they just take off and go there. And it's totally magic. And then when they get there, there's all sorts of other different dances they do. But yeah, so like the sorts of level of communication and, you know, hive mind stuff, it's just fascinating. So there's kind of, when you think from the outside in, as someone who isn't a beekeeper, you're kind of thinking you get these bees and then they go in the hive thing and then mm. you do some stuff and you leave them alone they get yeah. some honey Ooh. yeah yeah but actually like what you're saying is there's so many levels of nerdiness that yeah. can go into the learning of the thing because you're not just learning about mm. because there's different types of beekeeping as mm. well right because mm. you do a type of beekeeping that's more natural yeah or low intervention beekeeping like low intervention gardening. winemaking or gardening essentially it's the same thing um so i don't the beekeeping i was taught is not the beekeeping that i carry out and i've learned by my own whatever mistakes and trials and errors um, that my bees and I think bees in general probably like being fecked around with as little as possible. So I don't treat them. I don't give them any sort of treatment. I'm There's going to be beekeepers who are going to slam me for this. Like they really, really slam me. This is controversial. I don't treat them for varroa mite. I don't treat them for any of the things that they can get, you know, chalk brood, all this sort of stuff with either synthetic antibiotic stuff or with natural thymol and, and apigard is called. Uh, Essentially what I do is I build a much bigger brood during the during the summer and basically what that means is that you're not restricting where the queen goes through the hive because what most honey honey uh, beekeepers do is they want to produce honey. That's the aim. So they make sure that the brood is constrained within a certain part of the, 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 the hive and the queen can only lay larvae in the cells in the bottom part of the hive and then up above that all of her little minions can go and put honey in there, essentially honey and pollen. So they're gonna feed it to their stores essentially so that they think they're going to feed their babies and the beekeeper goes, cool, you're actually gonna feed me. Beekeeper takes those things, those top bits off in the wintertime and feeds the bees back 
sugar, syrup, fondant, that sort of, that's all standard stuff. That's not like wrong, because you're still getting good honey, you're not getting fed sugar, and there's all sorts of other things we'll talk about in due course about that. But what I do is I don't restrict where the queen goes. The queen goes up into all the parts of the hive, lays all the brood she wants to, and the magic of it is that by summer solstice, she knows somehow, angle of the sun and the sky, whatever it is, she doesn't make the brood bigger after the summer solstice. So after that time, naturally where the, she's laying larvae goes further down, that she slows down the amount of larvae she's laying, which is up to like something like 2000 a day at some point, it's insane. So she's laying her little egg things, but she lays them less and less and less and lower and lower down in the hive. So that by the time that August or September comes, I know that the top, and I know for a fact that the top two or three supers as we call them, like the two, the sections where the, where the, the kind of the wet, the wax cells are, uh, will be full of honey and won't be full of brood. Wow, mm. that's so interesting. Yeah. So is it, is it essentially what you do kind of like organic bee? Keeping. I mean, d definitely. It's it's like dry, uh, dry or lower intervention wine wine making or whatever, where you like you're not like drip feeding plants with this like solution of magic. You're 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 breeding hardiness and you're breeding resilience, and you're also by making a bigger brood, you're also getting faster genetic turnover. So you're hopefully necessarily getting more resistance to disease as a result of that bigger the colony, less chance of colony collapse. Um, and I mean, it's worked. Like this is the season is the fourth season in Rona. I have had zero, zero losses. I know that's, people are gonna go, mm, hubris pride comes before a fall, but I really have seen the difference. They're out early. I look after them at the start of the year. I divide the colonies up so that they're not, you know, overcrowded and all that sort of stuff. And then I kind of leave them at it until August or September. And yes, I have some swarms that disappear, but also they have massive hives. Like, I mean, my neighbors are not over the moon about the size of the hives, I would say. Um, and so, yeah, so it is essentially organic beekeeping. I can't, tr like the bees go up to five miles, right? Or five kilometers. So the, where they're going, they might be going to gardens that unfortunately, like my next door neighbor, might spray some Roundup. Um, but I know that by and large, they're getting all the different blossom, all the nectar from flowers and whatever within uh, five, five kilometers of here. So tell me about the components What's of in it? the hive. Yeah, so inside the hive you have essentially wax frames, which are, or sorry, wax wax sheets, which are set, you, you when you put the, the hive in first, now in Western beekeeping, we essentially give the bees a head start. So we give them a wax sheet that's imprinted with the little hexagonal cells. So they just have to draw out the comb. And it's amazing. They secrete wax out of these wax glands. It's like, what? And made out of literally nothing. It's kind of magic. Like their own digestive system, wax secretion. I mean, we secrete all sorts of things as humans as well. We don't secrete okay. wax. We do in our ears. We do. Oh, that's very true. I'm not sure if we could make... Anyway, um, but yeah, so uh, the, the you have the wax and essentially what the bees do is they, if you look at the center of a comb, you'll have, or like a frame, let's say, as we have it, as we lift it out of the hive, you'll have in the center where they lay their brood and then around that they lay stores of honey and then they cap those cells off in the finish. So they lay wax over the cells of honey and the honey is there to feed their, their brood. And then around the, the edges of that, you'll have pollen. Okay. And pollen is what they, you'll see them coming back to the hive with these little pollen sacks. They have these little bits on the back of their legs, so which are full cute. of pollen. And the pollen is essentially their, yeah, it's really cute, isn't it? Uh, the pollen, pollen is essentially their protein source and the honey and the nectar that they gather from flowers that they turn into honey because they puke it up essentially back into the cell, which is what makes honey. We eat bee puke, it's delicious. Um, and that is their carbohydrate source. So it's the protein, the carbohydrate, that's everything to feed their little cells of brood. Okay. Mm, and themselves. That's so interesting, isn't it? Mm. Like, I mean, the complete, I and mean, it's just so complex, yeah, isn't it? You yeah. just see, I remember the beauty of, um, I remember when we went to Cork that time, we were eating breakfast in that place, and they had like the whole honeycomb, oh, yeah. a massive honeycomb, and you could just go kind of hack off bits and mm. have it. There's something so magical. I think everyone who's seen that, yeah. everyone's <gasps> going to find like the honey yeah. with the honeycomb. Yeah. Because it's just such a beautiful structure, mm. isn't it? And amazing that they're just yeah. making it. And then honey, it's just this kind of, magical thing mm. and the goldenness and the elixir of the whole thing and i so i extracted a uh, or i helped a lady who as a customer of ours where she had a, a a beehive kind of infestation you might call it inside sash window frames or between sash window frames and her hollow wall construction in a basement where she was doing some renovations and the builders had come across and they were terrified so i went down with my bee suit and my poly box to try and gather the thingy and we had to hack out this kind of rotten window frame as we began to hack it out we saw these amazing filaments of beeswax. Now they weren't given any wax to start, but they had these like absolutely uniform filaments of beeswax that they'd filled out with, uh, with, with honey. And there was like just the space for one bee to pass in between each one of these like massive sheets running down the full length of this big sash window. There was like three or four of them at a time. And uh, like, it was just to see that, to see it like happen by itself naturally without me getting involved whatsoever. 
Bs have this amount, they have B space. So they know that like what's too big for B and what's too small for B. So if there's, there's a space in that hive that I put down for them that's too big. They'll put propolis in it. So they propolize. The propolis seals off from drafts, also seals the hive from infection. It's incredibly gummy. It's really difficult to prize it apart. And, and that, that means that they only ever end up with like one B space kind of transitions around the hive so that they know they have maximum draft prevention. They have perfect insulation, like in the winter time then. So when most of the bees actually die off, they live about six weeks in the summer and then a certain small component of the brood survives with the queen in the winter. And they just kind of ball around the queen and they just flap their wings because they have to keep the hive at specifically, I think it's 37 degrees at all times. And so they'll do that. And it's all by virtue of the architecture they've created inside the hive. And all this, it's just, it actually puts the hairs up on the back of my neck talking about it, even though I know it so well at this stage. And so hive mind, the idea yeah. of hive mind, we mentioned mm. it earlier, but that's become like a super buzzword now. Mm. People keep talking about hive mind. What Can you explain that a little bit? So as I understand the hive mind, I mean, it can apply to ants as well, as we've just seen downstairs. <laughs> um, but the hive mind is this idea of, of, of doing without ego, like this idea of understanding our role, uh, understand, and it's, and it's a beautiful thing when we reflect uh, on our own purpose in life, on our own nature, and we can kind of bring our own sense of the hive mind into our lives, where we kind of discover what our, not in necessarily our talents are, but what our personality, constitution, makeup, role in our society, in our neighborhood, personally, in our workplaces, in our family, and to sort of adopt the hive mind is to just go there and be the thing, as opposed to struggling with, I want to be more than that, I want to be something like, the worker bee doesn't want to be the queen. It's not even in their lexicon. Uh, they know that they're a nurse bee when they're a nurse bee. They know they're a forager when they're a forager. And they have this amazing communication that knows, like they'll always have a certain proportion of the bees inside the hive at any time, a certain proportion of bees outside. Same with ants. Is in, the ants thing is insane. It's like with ants, like when ant colonies have wars. So if they lose a portion of their, like they send a certain portion of the, of the colony out. And there's amazing studies where they've gone, like, you know, counted the ants literally inside these things. They tag them. I don't know how. And then... Um, you know, whatever, let's say a half a million ants in, a, in an ant colony, they lose 5% of those ants. Within, I think it's less than 10 minutes, they'll have reapportioned all of the jobs within the ant colony so that exactly the same proportion of ants are doing all the things that they were before, after, before that war happened. And that for me is hive mind. It's just like a knowing of the structure of society and it's like, no, there's no forcing because there's no point. It's just like, we know what we came here to do, we're gonna do it. Our life cycle is our life cycle. There's a sense of inevitability about that. But it's like, if you ever try to stop an ant in his path, he just walks over your finger, you know? You're like, he's just doing the thing. I was watching a documentary um, recently and they were talking about the wildebeest oh, uh, yeah. in the savannah and, and the hive mind of the wildebeest when they have to cross, because when they have to cross oh. that big, this is the Zambezi River, I'm mm. not sure. Um, there are many oh. different crossing points. And obviously it's filled with crocodiles. Mm. And if one wildebeest goes in, it's going to get attacked by crocodiles. Mm. But if all the wildebeests that are doing this massive like, migration over vast, vast, vast different distances, they all decide to go in at the same time, they're going to overwhelm the crocodiles and they'll go through, they'll trample on them and they'll go the whole way across. And they'll also be able to navigate the eddies of the water much better because they'll all be going as one union. Yes. And they had this... Mm they were describing that it is a hive mind because they all start crossing and they start coming from miles away and some of them are like three when the first ones reach the edge of the river and they all cross at a different place in the river every year people have been trying to film this crossing of the waters for ages and they cross every year at different places and they they all decide to cross at the one place each year who knows who decides it the ones who get to the front of the river are sometimes three miles ahead of the ones at the back of this wow. massive migration and they're all meandering like walking you can see them there's like aerial footage of them miles miles back meandering huge distances and they're all standing loads of them they're all starting to back up against the top of the river and they're all waiting and no one's moving and they're waiting and they're watching and they're waiting and one goes down and then gets eaten by crocodiles and they're all just waiting and then suddenly as one unit <laughs> boom, they all start going wow. and from the very back three miles back as one they start galloping march. oh like, and then no they go they're not, not, the not, ones at the yeah. front and the ones at the back gallop gallop it's not like one started then there's a ripple effect it's just they all go so the, the hive mind of them, something is communicating to them. And now we go at this yeah. moment. And then they just go across and hardly any of them get lost at that moment. Yeah. And so it's that, it's like that exact same, like the honey hunters in Nepal have mm -hmm. the same thing when they observe the bees, when they go up there to look at them, they have that thing where all the bees suddenly go. Drr, drr, yeah, like that's the beautiful to look at, their isn't it? Up and they all mm. go, it's like all at one. Drr, and that's drr. also for ventilation, isn't it? Yes, yeah. to keep temperature. Yeah, so the, there's the, the, the other thing with the hive mind, uh, another example of that with the bees that's amazing is when they, uh, when the foragers are sent out to look for a new honey sources or new nectar sources. 
And again, the senior foragers are sent out, the junior foragers stay behind because they're not so good in the wind or they don't know their way, they might get lost. And so the senior foragers come back and they communicate to the rest of the bees in this circle dance or waggle dance pattern. So a circle dance means that the, the honey is more than a kilometer away. A waggle dance means that it's less than a kilometer away. Like there's always, you know, and, and again, the entire hive receives the message from this one guy going or do, 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 do. Well, it's just amazing. Like it is, yeah, there's, I, like uh, bees will uh, swarm as well uh, if there's not enough pheromone being laid down by their queen so if the queen isn't seen as strong enough and that can be from a beekeeper's point of view if you make the hive too congested or don't ventilate it properly or la 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 or she can be like essentially malnourished or maybe she's getting old and then they'll swarm so there's there's loads of bits and they'll try to succeed her and they'll actually try and kill their queen sometimes if the queen is laying too much drone brood like too many uh, males and that's just a genetic thing I guess um and they'll ball around so that the, the, the senior kind of foragers, whatever, or nurse bees, I think it is actually, they ball around the queen and they literally suffocate her to death, take her outside the hive and suffocate her to death and replace oh. the queen because um, she's not laying enough of the worker uh, bees who are all females. It's awesome. Wow, that's and, uh, so interesting. Mm, it's magic. So just to deviate slightly from mm. the bee part, yeah. the honey part, yeah. honey, nectar of the gods, mm. as we were saying, there's loads of different things in terms of medicinal qualities yeah. and nutritional qualities. Yeah. There's loads of different parts of the honey mm. and the off products from the bees. Mm. We go into I guess, it. so um, the, the most common use is just, you know, honey in a squeezy bottle is what we're used to. Um, what I produce is a raw honey with the comb. People can eat the comb. The comb doesn't digest, right? So this is an important bit, actually. The comb doesn't digest, it goes through your body, but as you chew it, you extract the propolis from it, which the bees are putting into the comb to prevent infection in the hive. And so you're getting some benefit from that. It's something you kind of get used to. And actually, I think people who've had it as a kid, a bit like people who've had like raw milk straight from a cow as a kid, like when it's warm and sweet, uh, they really miss that. But if you haven't grown up with it, it's a bit of a funky texture thing to get used to. Definitely good for you, really safe, definitely recommend it and also it's just fun to bring raw comb home to your kids and go this is literally how the bees made it yeah. like in these perfect little capped off little jars little hexagonal jars so yeah so that's amazing so that's what kind of honey is there's also interestingly and we'll, we'll be talking about medicinal uses in a second i guess um but there's some interesting use of raw honey from a medicinal point of view you'll have a lot of honeys that are made from mixed uh, mixed nectar sources mm. uh, so they would be considered like usually find wildflower honey or whatever uh, most honey sources are mixed because you don't usually have like an area of foraging that's all like monofloral but you'll have things like manuka from New Zealand which is all from leptospermum which is the tea tree plant and the bees process the nectar from the tea tree plant which is poisonous to humans but they make it so they confer the benefits of tea tree which are the antimicrobial benefits and they make it digestible to humans by like doing their little bee whoop puke you know thing that's how they make their honey. Um. And, okay. Yeah. And so yeah, so sorry. Then you have loads of different types of monofloral honeys. You'll see people with pine honey and thyme honey and chestnut honey and Jamaican logwood honey and whatever it is. Uh, heather honey is an interesting one to mention from a, a, a medicinal point of view. So we'll get into that in a second. And so then there's also like propolis and bee pollen. All the products. Yeah. So, so propolis, antimicrobial, antiviral, anti anti uh, antibacterial. So it's an it's an antioxidant. So uh, as we we've talked about propolis, how it confers these protection protective elements to the hive it also does the same for the humans that consume it if you go like all of the people who are spanish or like central european sort of thing who come into our shop they're like the first they've got it's good i've got an itchy throat I'm propolis you know like that's the first thing they all know and that's how they speak every single one sorry um and so, <laughs> in that husky whatever it is voice um and so um the yeah so, so so propolis is a really powerful thing if you're getting the beginnings of a scratchy sore throat if you have like any even like some more chronic infections like h pylori there's some interesting research with but usually upper respiratory tract infections we'd use propolis for the pollen is really rich source of protein like we were saying so amino acids so it's a great source of nutrition for your for your body if you're having a breakfast in the morning that's porridge-ish which is very carbohydrate rich putting some pollen on it's quite sweet but it's also actually really rich in amino acids so great protein so it'll balance blood sugars um it's also really rich in in uh, anthocyanins and carotenoids so the different pigments that make the color of the pollen that's a really important indicator for how good it is for our health and different parts of our health more yellowy pollen good for your eyes good for mucous membranes more purpley pollen good for cardiovascular system good for immune system 
Royal jelly. Royal jelly. <laughs> Very unpredictable thing, actually. So if you get royal jelly in a capsule and it's not in a base of honey, I don't trust it. I don't sell it because I don't trust it because it's really volatile. Uh, it's the thing that's fed to all bee larvae for the first three days of their life, but it's fed to the queen for her entire life, hence royal jelly. Uh, and so it gives her, like she, she lives for five years, the rest of the bees live for five weeks up to two or three months if they're lucky. Uh, so that gives you a sense of like some of the protective benefits. And she's made from the same stuff. She's literally, they just choose a queen. She's genetically the same stock mm -hmm. as the rest of the bees. She's not different, but it's royal jelly is what does it. So that's an interesting thing. If you can get royal jelly, get it in a base of honey. So royal jelly rich honeys are sold somewhere. We used to have one from Arca Pharma in raw honey, which I loved organic as well. Um, but we can't get that at the moment, but that's, that's, a, that's a really good thing. What else we got? Propolis pollen, royal jelly. Uh, uh, okay, so yeah, so then, then let's look at um, beeswax as well, because you can use that in terms of like healing stuff. So beeswax is something I know as an emollient, right? Mm. It's particularly good if you put it into BAMs. Um, the, the nice thing with beeswax, it stabilizes BAMs for people who are making cosmetics at home. Um, but also if you're putting any beeswax BAM onto your skin, you can imagine it, it's waxy, so it sits on the skin, so it seals the skin and allows whatever herbs or whatever botanical or essential fat essential fatty acid components that you put into that balm to transmit to the skin over a longer period of time and providing this lovely healing soothing layer over the top. I don't use beeswax balms over raw uh, like eczema psoriasis type things because usually those types of non-wounds like you know they usually like to breathe and there's, there's a thing around that definitely I tend to use things that will absorb quicker and not sit on the skin. But uh, you can depends use on the actual person. honey right? But you can, absolutely situation. you can definitely use honey in that situation because it's an amazing healer it's amazing antimicrobial there's like hundreds of enzymes inside honey we know that there's like hydrogen peroxide is the first one that we found okay great we our immune systems produce hydrogen peroxide aka bleach to kill uh, bacteria inside our systems um we know hydrogen peroxide is contained in honey like i said but there's also like non-peroxide there's like something like nine or ten different studied enzymes they predict i think over a hundred maybe 120 or more enzymes maybe more than that and it's just about what humans can study so like there's loads of phytochemical activity in a raw honey that we don't fully know about that we just know is good hence nectar of the gods tutankhamun all that difference between raw honey and regular honey and why mm. one should pick one over the other so when you heat honey you obviously change the chemical nature of it so it's made of fructose and glucose and it's really important to understand that when we heat any sugar we denature that sugar we change its format we change its chemical structure and also you have some of those enzyme uh, compounds that are in honey that are fragile with uh, to heat so they're, they're sensitive to heat and um, so i think i I trust Irish beekeepers to not overheat their honey. So even if you don't see a certified raw honey, don't freak out about that. But if you're getting good quality Irish honey from a beekeeper with his name on the front, Mick Wilde's honey, you know, probably it's decent honey. Not always, there's some cheaters out there. You know, there's been some cases, you look up Malaga honey from the 1990s or whatever it is, and you'll see some people like introducing like Chinese bad stuff into their, uh, into their honey. But by and large, I think like certified beekeepers, you can see they'll have the, uh, in the CDBKA, which is the County Dublin Beekeeping Association, they'll have that seal on often if they're sold in, in Ireland with, as, as members of the Beekeeping Association. Um, that's, a, that's an important indicator for quality, I guess, other than if you just know the beekeeper. And, and so like honey is kind of expensive. If people are mm. looking to get like local honey or raw honey, then mm. you can go to say Tesco's and you can get lots of honey. So yeah. Why is it not good to just get like a Tesco's own brand honey? Okay, so um, we sell just, we, so we sell a, a Lithuanian honey, for instance, which is like a kilo of honey costs you 12 euros 60. I actually just gone up to 13.95, but a kilo, big old glass jar, a kilo of honey, 13.95, really good quality, forest honey, whatever, la la la. The thing is that that country produces honey almost year round because they have this temperate climate. They don't have just this short, like in, in Ireland, our bees are now making honey. They're building their hives, building their stores. That'll happen until latest August and it'll be gone. So you think in four or five months, Spain, some parts of Spain, Lithuania, Slovakia, Slovenia, a lot of those places can produce honey for the entire year. And so the cost of producing honey comes way down and because the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the production is way up. The problem with the Tesco stuff and the like, let's not say Tesco, let's just say the problem with the mainstream uh, stuff that you're gonna find out there. If, it, if it's a big brand honey and it, check on the back, it'll probably say product of EC and non EC honey or whatever it is. And that means that they've taken and blended honey from outside the EU, European Union, with honey from inside the European Union. Why are they doing that? Mm -hmm. They're doing it to make it cheaper. What's the problem with doing that? Because you can't trust what they're doing, where they're coming from. It's like, I mean, 
why would you do that? If you can produce a quality thing from the place that it comes from, you always want to do that. Everyone is interested in provenance. Like, you know, you wouldn't necessarily feed it to your kids. You, like, if, <laughs> if you know, heaven forbid, for some reason you're given this awful choice of like you have this honey uh, from this beekeeper and there's his, there's his face and there's his name and, da, 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 and he's never used any chemicals and you have this honey and you just don't know where it's from. You've never seen the beekeeper. It's a million miles away. I just wouldn't trust it. I just, there's no reason to trust it. So don't. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. You probably have thoughts on that as well, do you? Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I would uh, think of the same things and just think about like, you, you know, it's the same as choosing organic vegetables over non-organic mm. vegetables. You're just going like, how local is it to you? What mm. and, and, you know, what is it eating? You yeah. Know, the bees are literally foraging off that nectar. So yeah. you want to make sure that it's from somewhere that's not kind of dodgy and then they're not yeah. mixing in loads of rubbish into mm. the honey as well. That's yeah, the other thing. big time. That's a big um, factor. Okay, and just one last question. Mm. Manuka honey versus raw honey. Yeah, manuka honey. So non-peroxide activity is what's measured for in, maru in manuka. You'll see there's a, a thing called MGO, methyl glyoxal, which is a main, uh, what's been established as by a Danish university and a few others since uh, as being a powerful antimicrobial compound that works um, a bit like phenolic acid, essentially. So it's like weaponized. It kills MRSA. That's fact. So it kills methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus, which is antibiotic resistant staph. Well, that's a big deal. So really antibiotics can't kill it. Honey can. Hmm, interesting. We should probably be using a lot more honey. Why aren't they using it in our hospitals? I don't know. Go to Australia, they are. Go to Japan, they are. Yeah. Ireland, for some reason, not so much. Anyway, that's a big thing. So manuka honey, if you're getting a good quality Irish raw honey, you will have lots of enzymes in there that aren't so studied because manuka's had a lot of attention, a lot of money fed into the studies manuka. That's why you're paying a big elevated price for it. Local Irish raw honey, Lots of that benefit as well. We just don't know from batch to batch what the strength is and blah, 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 blah. There is a honey called heather honey, which has been reported on a lot lately. There was a couple of studies done in Ireland and in Scotland on the benefits of heather honey and comparative to Manuka, it's been seen to be um, very powerfully antimicrobial. Now, not MRSA resistant, powerful in terms of its ability to, to kill MRSA, but um, but definitely in terms of its antimicrobial activity, definitely still a really strong honey. Ulmo Blossom Honey, oh, the most amazing honey from Chile. We can't get it anymore. We had a beautiful brand of it until pre-Brexit times. And, but yeah, the ivy, there's an ivy honey as well that's in Ivy's Ireland, really good. and they've studied that loads mm. in terms of like chest, lung health. Mm. Things. So if you go to a farm, you'll see in the wintertime, most um, uh, cattle, if they're still on the land, eating the ivy. And they eat the ivy because they know that it works as a mucolytic because it, it thins out the mucus and it well, helps them clear out coughs, clear out like all sorts of nasty mites and stuff they get on their lungs. Um, and so it's the same for, for humans. Ivy honey is definitely one to use if you have chesty cough stuff in the winter. One thing we haven't spoken about as well is uh, hay fever. Mm -hmm. And we're a little bit too late already, unfortunately, for that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to... Uh, experience much re greatly reduced uh, hay fever symptoms uh, in the summertime, the best thing to do is stock up some local raw honey, like perhaps Drimna cup comb from my back garden out there, or any good other raw local honey, stock it up over winter. And when it comes to early spring, like February, March at the latest, start taking a couple of teaspoons a day and you'll see whatever it is, the inoculation, whether it's from the high pollen levels from local bees around your area, whether it's from other like immune modulating properties of, of honey, we don't know. It's one of those folk uses of honey, but there's so much folk medicine that's real medicine. This is what humans, like we survived two and a half million years without the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you very much. You've done lots of really good things but there's definitely lots of important focus and things. And when it comes to uh, honey, and we always see, you know, science catches up with it after the fact, like, oh, actually, hey, you're right, turmeric was really good for you. And it probably cured your arthritis and kept you alive and prevent heart disease, you know, and, and, and it's the same with raw honey. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? But now we, instead of being reliant on like years of history, testimonials and studies and talks mm. and all those kind of things, now we only believe stuff to be true if it's been like studied in a science lab rather than studied by humans over centuries. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's kind of interesting. I think though it would be nice to do a follow-up one mm. uh, where we talk about like the ancient folklore. Um, and Wouldn't it be the cool? historical references mm. and those kinds of things and what did they use them for historically and the kind of you know in need and all of those kinds in of things in all of these places in like Iran and yeah. in like so India we'll and Nepal yeah. deadly cool let's do that okay Yay, honey, for now, thanks for listening thank you very much thank you to our sponsors Clear Light Saunas um, and please like and subscribe and comment and DM us on our Instagram at Wandering Into Wellness and check out our merch <gasps> and so oh! we've got a capsule collection of carefully so curated conscious clothing that, that was, was good, the most, wasn't it? That was that six C's? I don't know. That's that? good. Well done. Curated collection. Capsule. Clothing, five. Capsule. Oh, wow. Yeah, six. Well done. Six. So impressive. Um, it's all that honey I eat, I think. <laughs>
<laughs> but it's going to be they're so beautiful and super soft organic cotton mm. printed locally in Ireland designed by an artist plus us um, plus and us. <laughs> and they're going to be so nice and they're the perfect clothing to wear on your wonders so it's mm. outdoor clothing for people who don't want to be wrapped up in Gore-Tex Tex-Mex Tex-Mex Gore-Tex Tex-Mex Gore-Tex zip zip zip, zip you know shiny material mm. things that make the annoying yeah. rustly noise but like outdoor Gardening, moving, mm. that kind of Soft, people like us want. sensual, organic, beautiful looking Super things. Super nice, so yeah. check us out. Yeah, stay tuned. Lots coming. The Wandering to Wellness Project. Boom. Yay. Bye. Come on, Bye.